Hello everybody and welcome back to the Mullen Studios podcast. It's been a while. It's been half a year, I think. Not as long as John Tron. Yeah, 11 months. Yeah, but again, we only had like one day off together during our At this point, work yeah. week. But we're cheating as I was on vacation at the time of this recording. And thus we can finally do this. Yeah. It's great. I've been actually wanting to do another one for quite some time. We just never get around to it. Yeah, we get pretty preoccupied. We get distracted. Yeah. It's the term that I would use. Get distracted. Well, I thought I was going to... But never mind then. Thank goodness. <laughs> but uh, to start this off with the most important question of the day, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. How about you, Delmar? I'm doing pretty good. I'm sleepy, but when I'm on vacation, your sleep schedule goes topsy-turvy and everything like that. All right. So, uh, who wants to start this thing off, you or me? Uh, why don't we go ahead and first talk about uh, what we've done so far while we've been not doing a podcast. Okay, um, I'll let you start. I guess we can go ahead and just start talking about our uh, Christmas break, you know, our little Christmas that we've had so far in the past month. Yeah, it was great. Uh, last year, we uh, did a Christmas party. Uh, where all the friends came over, I cut the burgers and everything, and Tommy was stuck playing Smash Bros on Wii U, and uh, it was so much fun. That was wonderful. I loved it, and this year we did it again. I think we had more people this time around, by two or three more people. Yeah, we did. Uh, and it was great. I grilled burgers, Chris did chicken wings, Tommy was stuck in Smash Ultimate. Actually, uh, by the time uh, they came over and started playing Smash Ultimate, you uh you were halfway through the roster and then after the party they were all unlocked. I wasn't I wanna say I was halfway, like maybe sixty five, seventy percent of the roster unlocked. Either way you still had quite a bit left. Tommy unlocked the rest of that part I'm painful for. Also do I discover my main Incineroar Yay he doesn't play Smash I mean I like playing Smash but not as much compared to Tommy. But he on the other hand does not and he finally found his main which is a Pokemon at first he did not like yeah. due to the evolution of Litten. Yeah, I mean, let, let's put it this way. You you got Litten, which is adorable little kitten. And then you see its evolution stage where it's starting to look like a tiger. And it's like, okay, this is cool. This is awesome. I'm liking how the evolution is looking. And then in center roar. Let's see. <laughs> kitten. Tiger. Luchador. What? One of these things is not like the other. <laughs> it's like, dude, why can't we just have a natural evolution? Okay, just just stick it to a four-legged lion or a liger. How awesome would that be if it was liger? Um, probably would be like it starts off with this evolution starts with like a baby owl, then it jumps to a giant two-story tall dragon, and then finally it turns into Hideo Kojima for all I care. <laughs> <laughs> uh, of course, it's not as bad as uh, Pabalu, where it's like technically it could be a male or female, which I think in normal traditional Pokemon games, the starter Pokemon is mostly male. Very rarely would it be a female. I don't know that. I, 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 if I'm not mistaken, I think that's how it usually goes, is that the majority of the time it's mostly a male, and that there's like a few, like I think it's like 10% chance that it becomes a female, rather as your starter Pokemon, and so to see Pabalu start as neutral, and then the next two evolution, it just looks like a feminine Pokemon, and it's like, I'm not against it, but it's just, at least with Ninetales, it still sticks to like a mammal-looking creature. With Pabalu, it's like Tutu, and then Beauty Majestic. Okay, I still love the pre-evolution. Pabalu is so adorable. But the other evolution is it's like, I'm confuzzled about this. What? Yes, <laughs> but, yeah, other than that, though, the party was really great. We had a wonderful time on that one. Yeah, and uh, and then this whole Christmas season, I think, was the best we had. Well, every year has always been great, but this one's been definitely good. This one has been better, what it has been. It's, despite our work schedule and everything like that, that has nothing that brought us down, if nothing else, the... Christmas season itself brought it up better, actually. So yeah, it, it was a lot better in terms of like 
Christmas season and joy. So yeah, it was great. And we've also watched a lot more Christmas show this year than yeah. what we did last year, I think. Or at least it feels like it to me. Feels about the same as it was last year. To, uh, but we'll make that up as I decided we can no longer watch Christmas movies on Christmas. We can watch them whenever you want to. Yeah. I mean, everyone keeps saying treat every day like Christmas. So it's like, we can do that. I still got some Christmas songs still on my MP3 player. By the way, Katy Perry's Cozy Little Christmas. It's really addicting. <laughs> that song is too good. But anyway, so, uh, but yeah, it's like, why not? You can just watch Christmas movies. I mean, heck, people can watch scary movies whenever they want to, even on Christmas. So, I mean, it's like, why can't we just watch Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer in August or something? Yeah. Plus, let's face it, they are releasing too many Christmas movies. We cannot... Uh, devote one month to it. We just have to watch it anytime, you know? I think at this point we can actually say you might as well just escalate it, you know? Yeah, especially Hallmark. I mean... <sighs> Again, like I said, they have a special budget contributed towards making Christmas movies and they've got like 50 of them lined up every freaking year and it's like, why 50? Because we are Hallmark and we flipping can. <laughs> Yeah, but it's like, then you don't get a chance to see, like, the good ones from, like, the past few years. You they know? don't care. They always want to push out more and more new ones. They 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 want to put a, push out as much new Christmas stuff to where the old ones completely erase. And it's like, isn't Christmas about tradition? And it's like, screw tradition! It's like, and no, yet, screw you! And yet, maybe half of those are, like, the same movie? Pretty much, yeah. Like, you get to one movie where... A couple doesn't get along and they're not going to get married or anything, but then in the end they reconcile and get married. Then you get another one where a uh, kid gets spoiled, but then just goes to trim at Christmas. Like, they're all the same. Not saying that they all. I'm sure there's some unique ones out there, but they all act and look the same. In terms of budget and production and all that. So it's like, what's the point of watching all 50 when half of them are the same thing? Pretty much, yeah. Although, surprisingly, in terms of, like, new Christmas stuff, we only watched it, like, two. Both of which originated from Netflix. And I love both of them. Like, I love the Christmas Chronicles. That was really good. Kurt Russell, I love his Santa. Uh, and then Angela's Christmas. That was, was super adorable, really sweet. Wrapped up like a holy sausage. <laughs> <laughs> Just, just watch it, and you'll see where we're getting. It's at. cute. It's a cute special. I love it. Personally. It's not even that long either. Like I thought it was an hour long or movie, but it was actually like a thirty minute program. Yeah, so. but it doesn't matter like how long it is, as long as it tells a good story and has good heart in it. Then that's all that matters. Right. Still looking for the Muppets Christmas Carol that does not have that song removed. We'll definitely have to make it a mission to look for that DVD. Or we could just make our own. That too. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> they got laser disc versions that they import online, so we could just make a copy like that. Makes sense, yeah. Oh, well, I think there's a laser disc version of it. I'm pretty sure there is. It doesn't surprise me. Laser disc, laser disc was popular at one point. Of course, I never really looked into like what happened to the rise and the fall of laser disc. That can be something that Company Man can do. Yeah, I would, I mean, have vinyls coming back so I can see my laser disc, but that depends if it's going to be like laser disc 4K or something. <laughs> yeah. But aside from that, though, uh, after Christmas and everything like that, and after New Year's, um, we ended up going to uh, Knoxville with uh, a friend of ours, and we met up with another friend of ours. Her name is Mouse. Uh, she lives over in Knoxville. And there's this one store that I was told about a couple of months back. And ever since then, I wanted to go inside because the pictures that showed on Facebook blew my mind. It was it was pretty cool. It's called McKay's. But McKay's is basically what I like to classify the world's biggest bookstore. Now, I say bookstore, but hear me out whenever I say this. They sell books, CDs, audio tracks, uh, final records comic books, novel books, uh, mangas, anime DVD boxes, DVDs, season shows, video games, accessories, consoles, f action figures, figures, whatever type 
of collectible thing that you in particular are looking for, they will more than likely have it inside. And it is insane. I'm going to go ahead and show images for you right here like I always do. But the store itself is just flipping enormous. And here's the thing. When you look outside the store, it doesn't look that big. It doesn't. When you go inside, it is flipping enormous. It's a two-story building. It's, it's flipping insane, isn't it, Daniel? Yeah, and I that's why I got a PlayStation 3 which I've been wanting my own PS3 for a while uh, for like 90 bucks for 320 gigs that's really good compared to like a uh, hundred or something dollars I saw like on GameStop or something mm -hmm. uh, which I'm happy and then uh, I found f 0 X a game I've been wanting to add for quite some time and there was one more thing I can't remember what it was oh yeah an outlaw on a Tide 2600 box for like Free bucks, but I was. That's really good. It's a really fun Atari game. I really like it, mm -hmm. especially when you like shoot the bullet up and it repels back down like a bouncy ball. <laughs> it's fun. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, uh, I had a couple of things that I traded in. I had a lot of credit that came out of it, and whenever I got done shopping for whatever games I was needing to get, I only spent like forty bucks. Did they? What did they do with like the remaining credit? Uh, well, keep in mind, it was only like 80 bucks, and I spent over 100 bucks in terms of games and stuff, so... Oh, I was about to say, it's like, you said you spent 40 or something. Yeah, well, I mean, in terms of actual cash that I ended up spending. Oh, okay. Yeah, after credit. Oh, I got, I got confused. It's like, Chris got like 10 games for 40 bucks? That's a good deal. Oh, trust me. If, th if there was, I would have gotten more, but then again there wasn't really anything else that I was wanting to desperately add to my collection at that point in time. Or at least <laughs> stuff that I saw that I was like, oh, I can go ahead and get this right now since I've got this much flipping credit, which I had never really gotten that much in credit before in a long while, not since like Game Haven was around. Yeah, although one thing that always annoys me when I go to a store it's like I go in there, it's like, oh boy, I got money, I got to buy some games. I go in there, and then I was like, what games am I needing? <laughs> it's like I have a wish list of games I would like to get to play some point in my life. But it's like, I forgot what they are. It's like, oh, bother. And you walk in with like something different, but it's like, I can I can see myself playing this. Yeah. I've been really looking back from my collection, like, uh, well, I'll get that to later on. Uh, for topic once we get done, but back to Knoxville. But yeah, we then but after McKay's, we went to like the mall. It was a lot of fun. Uh, and then uh, I just discovered something over at the Knoxville Mall about Cinnabar, which is literally not just a movie theater, but it's like a bar it has food. You can like bring food in the theater as well. They have an arcade that had a Mario Kart. On K cabinet, it's like, I want to play that. But then she's like, oh no, there's somewhere else that has it. It's like, mm. <laughs> We never did go inside of that other but one. But we were exhausted. But so. before we did come home, uh, we went into this one uh, gamer bar called Token. That was amazing right there. I don't know if anyone remembers, but in a podcast we did a while ago, we mentioned wanting to do like a video game bar. That is literally... Like what me and Chris are hoping for. It was amazing. And I even got myself my own drink. Hot cocoa. <laughs> yeah, that's the cool part is that it's not really... I don't even think they have served alcohol on their menu. Does it? Or do you remember? Um, I think it does, but it's well, not heavily advertised. Right, it's not heavily advertised. And I like that because, you know, most of the time when you hear the phrase a bar... The b biggest thing that's advertised is like alcohol and liquor and whatever else. In this case, it's not really the case. It's a very friend family friendly bar filled with arcade cabinets, pinball machines, game boards, surprisingly. Although the speakers for the music was a bit too loud, uh, I will admit, but other than that, I loved it. I got to play Mario Kart 64 after many years. Uh, after game burned out from the <laughs> Mullins retro bits. Boy! I have not played in a while. Uh, but still, it was it was an enjoyable Yeah, uh, I place. love... If you ever go tokens, we're not getting paid, though I wish we were. 
tokens go over there. It's like next to the theater or something. There's like a theater. Yeah, in the shopping mall there is. Yeah, well not the West Town Mall, but like in the plaza, whatever. I don't know locations in Oxville. Uh, we're native uh, in a small town, so when we get to big city, it's like... Where do I go? There's so much to do here. I, I, I need parental guidance. I'm stuck. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, uh, was there anything else we want to add? Uh, uh, I think that's about covers what all we actually did while we were not doing a podcast. So Yeah, we were having fun. Although I actually want to go ahead and, since we I was mentioned this earlier, this is a topic I think... Uh, I was going to belch again. What the heck? The Unburpable Burp. That's the yeah. title of today's podcast. So, okay, this is something <laughs> I want to talk about as I have a dilemma. Okay, it's not a super huge dilemma, but it's still a dilemma regardless. So, it's a shocking dilemma. Let's put it that way. All right, so I've been... if over the, I don't even know how to begin this. So I'll just begin anyway. So um, I probably have close to about maybe 500 games, and that's counting... Physically and very little di- digital only games I have. Like I was about to say, do you have digital games? Uh, I have like DuckTales Remastered, Shovel Knight, um, something else. I am going to download Gris on the Switch because that looks very good. Oh, okay. But uh, So I have games. And uh, one thing that I've said in the Dale Marshall episode is that I was going for a complete uh, Nintendo 64 collection. But think about it, I'm probably not. Uh, I mean, th- I still got like 30 games that I would love to add to my collection, but getting a whole N64 uh, library, because you know, I won't ever touch the sports game, so it's like, what's the point? But then, I also look at like other things, because like I got, I haven't collected like any Amiibos any this year. I got like Wolf and Ridley uh, over the past few weeks, and oh, and the Splatoon 2 Oc- Octo expansion Amiibos uh, or something. And I want to get back because I'm about 50 amiibos behind. Uh, but then also from that, I realized I also want to do other stuff. Like, I want to get back to Model Railroading, so I want to get back to like, collecting the Thomas Bachman and Hornby range. Well, Hornby's a bit too expensive, and since the now discontinued, it's going to be even mm-hmm. uh, up in price. Hmm. But then I also uh, get hooked into, like, Disney pins. It's like I really like to collect pins. It's like, oh gosh, is a. Uh, the question is, when is the point when you're collecting too much? And if collecting is like now becoming more of a bad habit of sort. It, like, I'm not saying like I'll be spending on collect like a hundred dollars on amiibos and games every pay period. Wish I could, but no. <laughs> but like at the same time, like when does it comes to the point where you're collecting too much and you need that scale back down. I think when you get to that point, you start selling off some of your collectibles because of how much you've racked up. And this kind of goes back to how the CU podcast talks about this a lot, about how you scale down your collection and stuff, because you build up relatively quickly, because when you're continuously collecting and you're building up your collection, then you run out of room. And so then you have to look around and go, what do I not admire the most anymore? Or what do I not like the... What do I leak... What ugh, What do what, you not like the least? What do you not like... Yeah, exactly. What do you like the least? And all that stuff. Well, so. my storage isn't that big of a deal. I mean, I still got good shelf space. It's just the fact that the, you get so much. And you like... Um, your collecting mind gets uh, changed over when you... I mean, heck, like... I have a Sega Dreamcast and Saturn, but... Even though back then... I really was happy to have a Dreamcast, and it's sad. It's like, oh, this is so cool. I love it and everything, but I haven't touched those systems in, like, two years. And, yes, I can't count. Don't ask how. So, <laughs> but, yes, yeah, like, I haven't touched those systems two years, and they're collecting dust. So, it's like, why bother having it if I'm not going to play it where there's someone out there who would really love to have a Dreamcast, you know? But, unfortunately, A, they're not as super common compared to, like, an NES or... Sega Genesis or anything, so it's like someone will get it, and it's now kind of getting hard to find as time goes on. So it's like I have, I actually have done for my collection. I haven't gone for like the N64 games, or like ones that's like, well, I don't play this one much. 
Because I will admit, there's some N64 games I have gave a shot, shot like uh, Shadowgate or I'm trying to think of another one, or like uh, Charlie Splash Territory that I play. It's like, this is. I'm glad I got to play it, but I don't think I'll see myself keeping it. But when you get to the point where you feel like you're collecting too much stuff, aside from. Like, you acknowledge stuff that you. Uh, were like, well, I can pass this off to a friend, maybe someone who will really appreciate it, but in favor of, like, collecting other stuff that becomes too overwhelming. Like, at one point, I know I said I wanted to get, like, all the Paradise Muppet figures, but those are... <laughs> that, that they are on the, uh, <clears throat> high end. Yes, it's like, when is it to the point where you think you're collecting too much and you need to, like, set your standards as, like, what you can collect and what stuff you will appreciate more, instead of jumbling around so many different stuff. I think the best way that I can explain that part is like how Metal Jesus talks about uh, when it comes to collecting. It's like in his top 10 methods of collecting retro games and stuff, he's like, uh, when everyone is going right, you go left instead. It's like the reason why games get expensive is because people are buying them and you're only adding on to that expense of the increased price and stuff. And so he goes on to say, instead of buying all the expensive stuff, go for like the cheaper ends first. And that's actually a good method to go by, is that buy the cheaper stuff first, and then eventually the expensive ones will be a little bit cheaper end as well. Uh -huh. So it's not a bad idea. It's just sometimes it gets to a point to where you do end up buying all the cheaper ones already, and then the expensive one stays expensive. <laughs> For a period of time. And so it's like. Eh. So eventually you do have money. To where you can buy the expensive stuff. Then you wonder. Was it even worth it? <laughs> yeah. Well I mean. I think the most I've ever spent on a game. Is Little Samson for like. $200. But I mean I still. Uh, love the game so much. That it's like something I wouldn't pass. But like. There's games I have in it. That's like. I know I'll never play that. Well, like games that like. Uh, you feel like you want to add, like, uh, Hyrule Warriors. I don't uh, really play that at all. I think the only time I ever played it was when I, we both played it together, but that's it. Right. But it's like, it's not really anything I could par with uh, yet, because, like, I don't know, I guess it just fits nice with the Wii U collection. It's like a game that you feel like you want to have, even though you may not be a big fan of it. I'm not sure. Uh, like, I don't want to, like, end up having... Uh, 50, half the games that like games I will never touch. I want it to be like, you know, games I'll know for fat I want to give a try on something. Right. And it becomes overwhelming since you got new games coming out, uh, you're discovering titles, like going back to other systems, like, how did I miss this? And some things like, you want to get that? Uh, well, I can see myself like if all of a sudden I decide to stop collecting games. Uh, five years down the road after getting my whole wish list completed, then I would be happy. Right. Until New York titles come, in which case, well, crap. <laughs> but still, I don't know. I, I guess, I don't know. If, it, if collecting becomes too overwhelming, and where did my list go? I, uh, I'll find it later on. <laughs> I have a, a list here of, like, topics, but it's like, oh, great, this missing somewhere. Well, where's on holiday? <laughs> or it's on holiday, at least. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, let's see, was there anything else you wanted to add that you can remember? Uh, to that topic, or to a new one? Uh, to a new one, or rather. Oh, a new one? Yeah. Um, well, don't we usually pass back and forth between the topics? Yeah, but I didn't really have any topics planned, really, in uh, all honesty. Well, I, I got stuff listed off already, so, uh, I got another one for you. It revolves around GameStop. Okay. Good old GameStop. I actually, like going to GameStop, I actually do. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't agree with some of the business practices and all that, but I like going over there. Uh, always nice to talk to like so many employees there. So far, our GameStop hasn't really had any bad problems. So, I mean, I mean, Record is probably some of the other ones that's been around longer and that they are needing more businesses and stuff. Yeah, but like you go into GameStop now and uh, like... There's so much news to like, I can't remember each exact one, but like how GameStop isn't performing as well in sales and all of that. And then, 
of course, when you go in, it's like 50% games, 55% hot topic related stuff like t-shirts, pop figures, figurines, socks, and everything, which isn't bad. But it makes you wonder, it's like, will GameStop turn into like a hot topic or something? It, and it might eventually, but it probably won't be until like five years down the road because there's obviously going to be the new console generation that's going to be merging in before too long, you know, what was the next PlayStation Xbox that they're constantly talking about now. So I say they'll definitely want to jump in on that one to where they can meet some form of sales. Yeah, well, I mean, the Switch is performing excellent. Oh, yeah, so no kidding. Hot. It's slowly catching up to the PlayStation 4, which has just now announced saying that they have sold almost 100 million uh, systems for the PS4. I can believe that. I can too, but I mean, the biggest thing that I'm wondering is this, is that I don't believe there's ever been a console that has ever reached a hundred million cells. Um, I don't think in record. Yes, yeah, so. sir. Has there? Yeah, the Nintendo Wii, 101, and the PS2, uh, 102 million. Oh. And Game Boy, or the original Game Boy, had over a hundred million. Huh, okay. So yeah, there's some that's gone up there, so it's not the first system. I was just wondering, because I was like, I don't remember hearing a system selling over a hundred million. So it just, it was kind of one, it had me thinking, it's like, how did we get to that number in the first place? It's, it's possible, I mean, heck, I think the Flea 60 was, if not was, is on hundred million, uh, I'm not sure. But like, back to GameStop, uh, you see all this test, it's like, I would hate to see it close. But they just gotta do something different to keep them, like this one store that's like, I don't know where it's at, it's in a mall, but it's a new type of GameStop called GameStop Pop Culture. Well, one side is all games and then the other side is just like pop figures, shirts and such. Kind of like 50-50, it's like, that's kind of interesting there, but that just reminds me of all GameStop in a way. So like, would or it is it sort of like slowly like one fourth of pop culture stuff, and then like the rest of it's all games still, still at the moment. Yeah, but you can't deny it's slowly overcoming with hot topic related merchandise and everything. It will eventually convert, but it won't happen until like literally within the next three to five, probably even seven years, depending. You know, it's hard to say really because. Depending on when they're going to start enforcing digital games, as much as we hate the ideal, they're going to do it eventually. I mean, hell, even Microsoft has announced it to some point that they're going to make two different consoles. They're going to make a disc-based version to where you can play both digital and disc version, and strictly a digital console. Which kind of makes sense. They wanted to test the waters to see... Okay, which one would sell more, the digital console or the physical as console? As long as it's not gonna like uh, get them into like a uh, like if it's gonna cost them to a lo loss or anything, then then that's fine. But if it's somehow making two di systems that are a bit different, but at a loss, that has me worried almost. I think what they're looking towards is that they're looking towards like to see if it's even promotely. Uh, profitable to sell a strictly digital console because obviously to have a disc version system you have to have the disc reader itself and I imagine that costs us a little bit of a profit in some form of way and so they're trying to make the system compacted to where not only does it meet today's standards for uh, quality and media but also in order to make it efficient in prices for the customer in order to purchase it. And hey, with a disc, without the disc, we you have more space to put in, like maybe an extra chip to uh, to read games quicker or extra system cooling fans or whatever. Which I still can't get over the Xbox One X having that liquid cooling system inside. It's like, huh? Yeah, that is confusing. But I'm so used to it being on PCs, not compute, not c compute, compute c systems, electronic devices, Dicky! That's sort of like how whenever the PlayStation 3 first came about, whenever it used to play PlayStation 1 and PlayStation 2 games. And then for some odd reason, when we got past the 80 gig size uh, PlayStation 3s and went to the Slims, uh, they just cut that part altogether in order to reduce costs and stuff. And people started to wonder, it's like, 
is emulating games that expensive? Like, is that really an expense that just needs to be cut out at all? I doubt. I doubt it. It sounds extremely cheap, but then again, I'm not. I don't know anything about the video game hardware, so I don't know if if it costs more or like to make sure it runs every single disc. Uh, for that, like you have some PS2s that have trouble with the blue disc, uh, which is something I'm familiar with all the time. <laughs> But I think when we get to the next console generation, all it's going to be mostly is that it's literally the same system, but with way advanced hardware. Like, more advanced than what the PlayStation 4 or the Xbox One is currently is. And so, everyone is like, it's more than likely going to be pa uh, backwards compatible to Xbox One games and PS4 games. Which would make sense because if the quality isn't going to change, and instead the hardware is going to be an improvement, that's basically all you're doing. It's, it's more or less like getting a new PC with better components and stuff. Which at that point makes me wonder, do we even need another console in the next five years? Honestly, to be fair, I, I know technically it's been five years for the PS3 and Xbox One, but I still, I guess because of the long... Uh, life cycle for like the PS3 and Xbox 360 that the idea of a brand new system coming out next year or even late on this year just seems like too soon maybe. It is too soon. I don't think they're gonna announce it until like 2020 and then it'll be 2021 before they'll be available on shelf. But even still I'll be waiting two years after its original release because that gives it a better time to fix out any bugs that might have been missed out whenever it first hits production and stuff, and it gives it a build up for a good lineup of games. Well, heck, there's rumors all the time saying about a new Switch uh, version, like maybe a smaller system, I'm not sure. How could you make it smaller? It's pretty small on its own. I'm not sure. Like, they keep saying like a new version of Nintendo Switch that'll be a bit improved, but mine's, mine's perfectly fine. As it is, unless they're going to fix, like, say, the dock, which if they somehow make the dock better to where it doesn't scratch the switch or have it just wonky, uh, I will be up for that. I will be up for, like, a new type of dock system for the switch. As the one, it's not awful, but it could have been a bit better. Right. Uh, especially since people had complained they had got the, when they put it in, had, like, scratched or something. Hmm. I'm not sure, but... Still, it would be nice uh, to see like a new version of the dock. I've been tempted of getting this one dock. It's a third party one. It's like a kind of like the Wii U holder or like the Wii U charging. Yeah. But I heard that it's not that good or like it causes problems, but I can't remember the brand hmm. for it. I, I know I saw it at our GameStop. If we won't go over the next time, I'll have to show you. Oh, okay. Uh, Actually, I just realized we have not been talking about game stuff at all, but regardless, they'll, they'll, they'll be fine. I believe in them. But well, let's put it this way. Depending on where GameStop is at, that's where they will survive the most. For example, here in our little town, it will survive because there's not many game stores here in this town. The only thing you've got is GameStop, whatever retail stores that do sell games, and then pawn shops, which... The pawn shops, every once in a while you do find a good one, but they're pawn shops. They're going to sell them at outrageous prices. It's like, oh, hey, yuck, I got Duck Dodger starring Daffy Duck and on 64. How much is it? Five, $500. What? You're not far off from the edge. I mean, it doesn't go that high, but even a medieval one, I saw it on their uh, lockup case, and they had it labeled for like 50 bucks. And the case didn't even look that good in condition. And I was like, I can easily probably find it for probably 30 bucks and it still be in good condition of a case, you know. That's just crazy. It is, but that's just how they have been and how they're going to go about it. They're pawn shops. They're allowed to scalp prices however high they want to. It's their storefront. It's Stupid. wrong, but it's their storefront. They can Stupid scalp scalpers. it however high they want. Stupid scalpers, I don't like the one bit. <laughs> but anyway, though, uh, any more before we move on to a question that we received some time ago? 
I can't find my list. I know I had something else, but I'll get to it. Plus, I probably have some more suggestions for future podcasts. But let's go and get to the question because I think this one might take a little bit longer. Yeah, it will be. I forgot the name, which I do apologize. I'll be sure to put it down right through here after I look it up and stuff. But they basically asked the question, what was our life like during the 90s? Now, this question is going to be more or less of me remembering most of it because I was born... In 1989, I was born practically at the end of the 80s, and I was literally uh, living at the beginning of the 90s. You were born towards the beginning points. You were in 94. Me and Forrest Gump. Actually, I have the same birthday as uh, Super Metroid's release in the U.S., March 19th. Which is crazy. We're, we're, is. we're pals, even though I only played it once, but... <laughs> We're going to get together, we're going to go to the bar and drink some hot cocoa, reminisce some memories. She's probably going to shoot up aliens and I'm going to be hibernating, so. <laughs> Actually, am I even, oh wait, now I have to work. That's why on my birthday, so. Anyway, continue. But, uh, yeah, the, ni- the 90s, I think the best way to explain the 90s is that having reruns was not a problem. And let me explain what I mean whenever I say that. You have cartoons that are going on right now, like for example, Steven Universe, uh, help me out here, Daniel, with all the show that's going on right now um, that I can't remember. Oh, KKO, um, Star vs. the Power of Evil, I don't watch those shows, or I haven't seen much of Basically them. Basically all these new shows that's coming up, and there seems to be newer shows coming up almost every year, or every like three years it seems, I think. And depending on how the creator or the series goes, it can go for like a good three to five seasons, which it isn't bad. But then in the 90s, and it's hard to believe this, I know, but in the 90s, they were rerunning shows that was aired back into like literally in the early 50s. We're talking like you got your normal Mickey Mouse and Goofy Donald cartoon shows, you got all the good Looney Tunes cartoon shows, which the weird thing is, and I even brought it up to a friend of mine, uh, that technically the Looney Tunes was licensed at one point in time back in the early 90s to Nickelodeon. Yeah, that's true. Uh, that he, was before Nickelodeon had like the Nicktoons with like uh, Rockers Mon Live, Doug, Rugrats, Rain and Stimpy Show. Yeah, they used to be on Nickelodeon at one point because they didn't have a lot of cartoon shows at the time. And plus, I believe Warner Brothers didn't really have a major show, or not a show, a channel that was broadcasting like Looney Tunes and stuff like that, which well, then, it didn't. But When did Boomerang became its own channel? I don't really know right off. I, I can't say when it began because technically by the time I discovered it, I shortly discovered Cartoon Network. But let me go ahead and just kind of progress through the 90s before we jump into like when, what, where, and stuff like that. Uh, you gotta remember, I jump around a lot. I understand, but I think people need to know what the 90s was like to begin with. Because for me and Delmar, we watched it a lot more television than we did with video games. We didn't get into video games until literally like towards the end of the 90s, 97, 98. It was around PS2 generation. Like yeah. as, when I got the PS2 for my 8th birthday, that's when we discovered like about more about like, uh, the video game industry, about G4 when it was good yeah, and had good content and, and good stuff. You know, like it was good! Good! But I miss X-Play. <laughs> but... There was a lot of different older shows that would appear. Like, for example, another interesting thing is that back in the early 90s, you know how they had, you know how, uh, Walt Disney had his, uh, shows that he would appear in, talking about the creation of Walt Disneyland and stuff like that, right? Yeah, they would air reruns of that. Yes, they would air reruns of it. Record, it was early of a morning, but they did reruns of those. And those were interesting times. You know, you got these cartoons that aired like 20, 30 years ago and you got into this generation where we don't see a single rerun of it on television. You're lucky enough to see it on YouTube, but because of it being on YouTube and the stupid copyright claim and stuff, they have to buffer it or they have to cut certain pieces out in order to it 
past the copyright thing, which really sucks. They also had reruns of The Muppet Show oh, yeah. on Disney Channel. Uh, Traffic, there was one other show that they had reruns on Disney Channel. I can't remember. Ba basically, back in the 90s, showing reruns of older shows wasn't a problem. They did this because people kept watching them, and they knew that if people kept watching them, that they had to re-release them over and over on television, and no one was panicking about getting like a collector's box set because they would show up on television all the time. And to the record, they still do reruns today like on a, uh, I forgot if it's HBO, whatever channel it was, when F Fraggle Rock hit it its like 30th anniversary, they have reruns of Fraggle Rock showing. And I think it's still going on, I believe. Well, that's good. That's good to know that there's at least one good show that's still rerunning. Yeah, and I... Th um, it's like, that you don't see that anymore, like, seeing reruns, like, I, I think Cartoon Network would really benefit if they show reruns of, like, Ed, Ed, and Eddie, or, uh, Johnny Bravo and stuff, like, you don't have to devote time to all the new stuff, you can just do reruns of, like, all your older cartoons that people won't mind, because that means it gives people that grew up with those cartoons to show to their kids, uh, what they watched, and some of the cartoons that were, uh, like made in in the nineties, still hold up for today's standards. Right. Maybe a bit too much relevance for today's standards. Yeah. But the thing that I the thing that became the problem though was that uh, we went to that transition in the early nineties of where we had that little transition of where we had newer cartoons like for example the Rugrats, Rain and Stimpy, Rock is Martin Live, um, and. Later on, throughout that decade, we then hit another transition of where we entered in more cartoons like Hey Arnold and Angry Beavers. And those were still good cartoons. I liked it, Angry Beavers better than Hey Arnold, but a lot of people seem to like Hey Arnold I better. I barely remember anything about Hey Arnold. No offense, I just didn't get into it. I, I, tried, I, I liked it the first season of Hey Arnold. After that, I kind of lost interest in it. But then you then go in towards like the end of the 90s where Nickelodeon was like introducing more live action stuff because obviously after all that and the introduction of like other uh, people who was in all that. Like for example, The Amanda Show. Uh, I liked The Amanda um, Show. Keenan and Kel, which that was a good show. I liked The Keenan and Kel. Yeah. I liked that show. But then you had even more shows that come out, like for example, uh, Drake, uh, Drake and Sh Josh. Um, there was a lot of like Zoe 101 on Fabulous. I I somehow remembered those. But it just got to a point to where there was more live action stuff and not enough cartoon stuff. So I, you and me, ended up migrating towards Cartoon Network when we first discovered it. They had like Conan Kiss next door, and I'm gonna. I hope you don't mind me interrupting for a sec. No, go ahead. Because even though I was born in 94, I consider myself more of a late 90s, early and mid 2000s kid. As I remember more, like even though I watched it shows like Ren and Stimpy and Dexter's Laboratory in the 90s, I remember more like the shows introduced in the early 2000s like SpongeBob SquarePants, Fair Out Pants, Jimmy Neutron, Ha Ha Puffy I'm a Uni, and stuff like that. But that doesn't mean like I don't remember some spot aspects like the 90s like how he had those VHS tapes or like when they had Pokemon VHS tapes and they had like three episodes in each tapes we had a crap ton of those a lot of like Rugrats VHS tape because uh, like it seems weird to, to think that VHS tapes that only contain like three episodes were considered were like a major package but then again it's like if you want to watch one particular episode like say you want to watch the episode where uh, Tentacruel like kidnaps Meowth and controls him, and Horsey's trying to stop Tentacruel in the original Pokemon anime. You'll be lucky to try to find that compared to like so many other episodes they released in Pokemon. But since you had the VHS tape that had that along with two other episodes, it wasn't that hard to keep track of, and you could watch that whenever. Right. Of course, this was before the invention of DVDs and stuff, where you can just hit scene selection, and then boom, you found it. Yeah, but I mean, at the time, it was great. If they cram-packed VHS with, like, maybe 10 long episodes of Pokemon, that would be good. But if you want to, like, try to find, really want to watch one particular one, you have to fast 
fluid on a v it VCR so I got gas in my belch. Eventually that burp is going to come up and it's going to be allowed. Probably, so warning about speakers just in case. <laughs> but uh, like, but the thing about the 90s that I remember a lot, that I remember a bit more in the 2000s, it's like going to the rental sh shop and renting games and movies all the time. I miss those days. It felt like a special occasion where like once a week, uh, mom or dad would drive us up to Amps which, ironically enough, uh, the, we have a location here called Amps, which started out as a rental store, r renting games and movies. But they actually just want to become a tanning salon. And this just start, and they start a rental business just so they can save up to open up a whole tanning business. And they're doing really good. Really? Um, I did not know that. Yeah, I talked to Ona that I like. I thought that it just changed owners and the owners just wanted to turn into a tanning place. Oh no, they actually just, they wanted to wish we turned into a tanning salon. I could be wrong, but I'm makes pretty sense. sure about that. It makes sense because before this one thrift store became a thrift store, it used to have uh, DVDs and VHS. Movies and for sale. Movies for sale, yes. And it wasn't before it went out of business that they also invested towards tanning beds and stuff. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it, I guess that's kind of a weird transition going from a rental store to tanning salon. Well, I mean, it was huge business back then. Yeah, it was. Mom used to go to them a lot back in, like, the early 2000s. That yeah, much I remember. But, uh, but, yeah, like I said, I'm not, I don't consider myself a 90s kid specifically. I mean, yes, 94, but I remember much more in regards to, like, what it was like growing up in, like, the mid-2000s and so on. Uh, but I still remember, like, aspects of the 90s and some embarrassing a childhood memories as well. Actually, there was one more thing that I want to kind of point out that happened in the 90s before we uh, progressively go any further beyond that. That was also the best time to be a Disney fan because oh, they yes. released those special Disney movies, VHSs. Um, they basically was releasing a whole set stream of their Disney movies from like Snow White all the way to Orange, like uh, whatever it was before... Uh, the Renaissance thing and everything like that. I think Oliver Company was the last film. Yeah, I think it was before Little Mermaid and stuff. And even then, they yeah. re-released the Little Mermaid towards that collection as well. Yeah, and I love like the art on the VHSs. Thing. Oh, they were awesome. I loved it though. Those are probably like the best covers uh, that came out during that time. But also too, the cool thing was that after you watched the movie towards the end, they showed you like the behind the scenes of the making of the film and that was yeah. really a treat to watch and what was weird is that for a kid you wouldn't think they would be into that but I watched those a lot whenever I was younger it's like either I watched the film and then I would actually watch the how they made it or I would just fast forward it towards the part to where how they made it and then I would just rewind it back just to watch the whole movie and just be enjoying that Cause yeah I, well heck one VHS tape that I remember loving was The Spirit of Mickey. Uh-huh. Like, in it, they show some of the best, or some of the favorite Mickey Mouse cartoons. That was, it. like, the best Mickey Mouse uh, VHS copy they've ever had yeah, in years. Yeah, I think the real treat was, like, at the near the end, you see Walt Disney himself, like, talk about Mickey Mouse, about, like, how they always want to remember to remember Mickey, and how he first kind of met Mickey, and then they play Steamboat Willie, and I was like, Really cool that they included a bit where Walt Disney actually talked about Mickey and then play Steamboat Willie. Granted, there was one scene in it that they cut it out, which was a scene where like uh, Mickey picks up the mama pig and starts playing. Uh, oh the song, yeah. Which I understand that cut, but that was the only real thing, and uh, it was just uh, I remember loving that tape so much, and of course the trolleys back then. Which sing-alongs, I think, were more popular in the 90s compared to they are today. Like, yeah. you had the Thomas sing-along, which I think that was my very first Thomas VHS tape was the first Thomas sing-along. And then you got the Disney sing-alongs, the Muppets, and uh, some other, like the We Sing, that was hugely popular Oh, at that the time. was. I forgot about that. They there were popular. A, like a Barnyard VHS? I can't remember. I, all I can think of is like we had this single on tape that had like this orange chicken costume. Not orange, like a yellow chicken that takes place in a farm and they like did sing alongs. Yeah. I can't remember the name of that, but I remember that. 
but like sing-alongs they were really popular as they were really engaging for like kids to get in you don't see that anymore you don't really see like devoted sing-alongs like maybe maybe once in a blue moon but like back then they were all over the place oh yeah you couldn't go anywhere without seeing a sing-along in any particular store whatsoever. and they would have a shelf devoted I'm pretty sure there was a shelf that was devoted to like sing-alongs or something there was that was a long time ago but there was a shelf dedicated towards sing-alongs um, and there was at least three Disney sing-alongs <laughs> or five because I mean you got some that devoted to like Disney Renaissance there like one that would be devoted entirely to like Little, Little Mermaid one that'll be devoted for like the classic era of Disney, and then you got another that focuses on a live action with like Zippity Duda or Step in Time, uh, all that. Uh, heck, speaking of VHS, I think for like Song in itself, uh, they've had a VHS tape that had like the cartoons that appeared in Song in itself. Uh huh. Uh, but like never, the, I think there was a VHS tape of Song in itself at least. Okay. There was something anyway. I wouldn't mind actually watching that. I mean, I know a lot of people are considering it not really up to, like, the times or something, or, like, how it doesn't tr uh, treat the people back then, but I wouldn't mind watching it. I mean, you got a Disney attraction based on the movie itself, so it's like, you gotta have to remember somehow. I mean, what's wrong with just watching something historical and stuff like that? And it just, it kind of gets irritated to hear people, it's like, oh, this is old-fashioned, why do you watch it? And it's like, because it's enjoyable. Well, and heck, it's historic. We were, literally before we started recording this, we were watching some goofy cartoons, and there was this one where it had, like, uh, that took him back in the old Russian, like, with the wagon trails, and you had these bunch of goofies that are, like, Native Americans and such. It's like, sad part is, I'm now picturing someone... There would be at least a good hundred people... Who would say this is extremely offensive towards the Native American. And it's like, it's supposed to be comical. Like, my main issue is like, first of all, you gotta consider the time it was released. I mean, yes, you can acknowledge just like stuff that uh, we have grown and learned of people that back then we wouldn't do today. But that was just back then at the time. So you can't erase history. Something that people are forgetting nowadays. Is like, that those that fail to uh, learn their history are doomed to repeat it. And plus, it's not that, it's still funny. Like, the Rush of Energy has become one of my new favorite goofy cartoons. <laughs> and, like, the shot where they show some of the Chief Indians, and you have one that's, like, Chief Cleveland baseball player. Like, that's... Cleveland Indian baseball player. <laughs> I love the Apache because he's covered in patches. <laughs> yeah, and then Chief Rain in his face. <laughs> and then when they're, like, you see, like, you just see, like, this huge Rush of Energy of these goofy armies of goofy Indians going in attacking the wagon trail and throwing arrows and such. It's like they are fr that you're giving everything to God even the kitchen sink and he just gets hit by a kitchen, kitchen sink. sink. <laughs> like that's funny it's like if they were intentionally trying to be mean spirited I can understand but they were just trying to be fun and light hearted and that's something that's really sad like I still get angry when I heard about people being offended by Rudolph because Rudolph was getting bullied, it's like, kids do that. Like, yeah, it's bad to have kids make fun of other kids for something, but they're gonna do that regardless. And plus, it's fifty plus years old. Yeah. You're just now complaining about it. It's like, like whatever happened to just having a laugh? Like, yes, there's stuff, there's actual racism and everything, and we need to learn. To learn from one another that we don't accidentally offend people and everything, but if it's a kid's cartoon released back in 1950 something, I don't get it. Just, I really don't. I think people just do it just to get attention, and it's definitely something that's becoming a concern over in online media, is what it is. is and ruins other people's fun. Yeah, it does. It's like, sure, I don't know, man. Thankfully, that wasn't li it wasn't like that in the 90s. I think that but, part kind of p appeared up more like after, or at least I know it more around 2012. I think 2012 was whenever all this mean-spirited stuff started to kind of come up to the rise. Or like people being easily offended and all that. Yeah, it, it wasn't really a bad time in the 90s. I don't know why it was such a major problem now, where in the 90s, 
it wasn't that bad. You know, you had yeah. people record. I may be completely oblivious because we were kids back then, but in the 90s, there was no really major difference between each individual person. Like, or at least it didn't feel like there was. Like, everyone got... I remember everyone getting on fine. The most trouble I got is, like, when, if I accidentally made Mom mad and she got the paddle. <laughs> Mom can be scary when she's mad, but she taught us well. Yeah. You know, and I think that's one thing I remember is, like, like how she taught us so much about... Right for wrong, learning to love our neighbors, learning about Jesus and and everything. Like, uh, she did, uh, mom, I think is like a best, uh, she's like the best mom ever. <laughs> and I would like to include in my videos, but I know she's very camera shy. Oh or, gosh, yeah, very camera shy. But still, uh, it's like, uh, you know, she taught us so much, I think because of her and dad's love, uh, it helped us see the world as something better and help us, like, even though it's, like, stuff in the 90s that was going on that was causing conflict that we didn't notice it. Yeah. I think the biggest conflict we ever had was trying to fit enough socks and clothes on during bad winters. Yeah, back then, winter time was a lot more colder. And deadlier. Well, <laughs> not deadlier, but we did have the blizzard in 90 flea in our small town, which i see photographs. Snow was up, up to this high. It's like, oh boy. Back then, the only reason why the power could have gone out was because we had a snowstorm that big. Uh, instead of it being just an ice storm. Which is all we get sometimes. It's just nothing but pure and utter ice. Which is worse, in my, in my opinion. It's like, I'll take the snow. The snow is fine. The snow is great. It's pretty. You can like you have your... Uh, and you get water and such. Instead, we get a solid sheet of ice. Just one solid glass sheet of ice. And every single time you step outside, you fall straight on your butt. Ever since the ice storm pack few years ago I don't want ice it's like if I hear snow it's like <gasps> snow with a chance of ice bugger yeah I think the worst ice storm we had was of course a few years ago where uh, I was coming out of the factory at the time and uh, the grass was slippery in ice that I was sliding through grass through grass that's <sighs> the weird part grass being slippery and then by the time I got to my car after ice skating to it, uh, I then had to basically ram onto my car door just to break the ice around the door just to open it. And then I stayed there probably for a good 30 minutes until the ice melted off the car and carefully pull out. Because I didn't know if it was iced or not. Oh, and carefully drive home. Like, there was so many broken trees, but... Oh we're, getting, we're getting lost track here. Uh, we're running through the 90s! <laughs> uh, <laughs> Actually, that's a show that I think you and I could probably be a part of. It's like, I love the 90s! <laughs> remember that show on VH1? Where it's like, I love the 60s or the 70s or 80s? Yeah, I remember. The, well, I vaguely remember. I didn't watch much VH1. Uh, Those were interesting to watch because it was interesting to see some of the older stuff that came out during those times. And heck, there's many shows... That came out in the 90s that are still a huge part of my life. Like, I know technically Thomas is an 80s. It started like in 84, but like by the time I was born, uh, season 4 would be out one year later. And uh, watching that, Theater Tugboat came out and Shine Time Station was still popular around that time. Along with like The Random Stimpy Show, uh, Dexter's Laboratory, and so many great shows. I uh, remember watching Thomas in the early uh, 90s, really, before you were born. I remember watching Thomas. Well, it didn't come to the U.S. until, like, 91? Yeah. Because Shining Time Station is the show that brought Thomas over to America. It's like, show in the U.K. started in 84, but it wasn't until early 90s when Thomas became known in America. Right. As such. Uh, and you had, like... The great narrators like Ringo Starr and George Carlin narrating, uh, and just talk about movie fe the movie theaters real quick. Uh, you mean the old two movie theater that was back then? Yeah, it's like going to theater. I remember, I think the the only the oldest movie that I can think of that I remember seeing was The Bug's Life. Was my very first movie 
that got the song feet is. The oldest one that I remember seeing was actually that of, I want to say it was either Toy Story or The Hunchback, no? I can't remember when, but definitely it was Hunchback of Notre Dame or Toy Story was the first one that I saw in theaters. For me, anyway. I say Toy Story for me as well, but I was, but that, no, that came out in 95, so I would not have remembered that. But Bugs Like came out a little bit later, so it's like I remember visibly me in the feeders watching like these ants trying to stop these grasshoppers, and heck, we used to, a tradition, watch every single Pixar film in theaters, but after. Wally or something like that we hadn't been to one since even though I love up really really love up and Toy Story is great but then there's other Pixar films I haven't watched or there's planes which no one talks about anymore well that's it's not really considered a Pixar movie because it's actually animated by Disney themselves really I thought it was a Pixar film uh it's based on a car series yeah but it's actually animated by Disney huh that might explain why no one talks I about think. it. I think. But, like, I know we saw Brave, which was... It was okay, but it wasn't anything that really deserved an Oscar that year. Like, I remember watching it, hear about the Oscars and Brave one. It's like, really? Brave? I was thinking, like, wreck it Ralph for... Par- yeah, that was the year Paranorman came out. Well, Paranorman deserved an Oscar, not Brave, so... Yeah, Brave was okay. It was a good film, but it wasn't, like outstandingly good. I wouldn't give it an Oscar. No offense to the director or anything, but I wouldn't do that. Uh, But like, and then the good dinosaur, no one talks about it, but it it looks harmless enough. Plus the idea of a dinosaur having a pet human. (laughs) That just seems funny to me. That does. (laughs) Uh, Plus I think, uh, Sam, uh, crap, I forgot his name. Sam Elliott, the, you know, the deep, the guy from, uh, The Big Lebowski, the narrator. Oh, yeah. That was Sam Elliott, wasn't it? I think that's his name. I can't remember. Yeah, he plays that one, the T-Rex. It's like, I just want to see that. Uh, like, other great movie experience. It's like, I remember we're doing, seeing a lot of them, and I remember when I was young going to see Thomas and the Magic Railroad, we were over in Nashville, I believe. Cookville, actually. Was it Cookville? Mm-hmm. It was. What? Well, Actually, yeah, because I remember the theater being humongous and everything, but... And yet the theater room was smaller. Yeah, but still, it's like, it was just great. I mean, the movie itself is... Eh, now, but, like, at the time, it was just great seeing uh, Thomas and everyone on the big screen, even though I had no idea what was going on. But regardless, <laughs> uh, what other great movies did we see in theaters uh, in the 90s? In the 90s, specifically. Did we see Mulan and Tarzan in theaters? I know they were technically late 90s, but... I know we saw uh, Tarzan in theaters, but I don't remember if we saw Mulan in theaters or not. Yeah, but... uh, I know we saw Pocahontas in the 90s. Yeah, Pocahontas. That came out after Lion King, didn't it? Yeah. And then, of course, we saw Lion King in theaters, I believe. I would, I would not have any memory because it came out literally the same year as I did. So yeah, I would have no memory of this. Like, uh, I just remember watching that one dozens of hundreds of times. Yeah, but uh, and then you had the Lion King sing along VHS tape <laughs> because obviously every Disney Renaissance movie had its own sing along tape. Going back to it, which uh, it was, it was a uh, again. I would consider myself more of a late nineties early to mid-2000s kid, in all honesty. And to be fair, that kind of gets it too peppy for someone uh, say it's like, I was born in not December 31st, 1999 at 11.59pm. I'm a 90s kid. It's like, no, you're not. <laughs> say what you want, but I mean, it's about your perspective of where you think you grew up in. And if you were grew up late in the 90s, or something, it's like, I don't know. So... I consider myself more of a late 90s, early to mid 2000s kid, but that's just me personally. Mm. So at least I'm honest. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, I guess I can't really think of anything else to add on toward the 90s. Yeah, again, like for gaming, we only had the Nintendo 64, which was our only system. And we really didn't get that many games for it. 
we mostly rented it for the N64. Yeah, I'm, like, I rented De Dodge's Star and Daffy Duck a lot. Pokemon Coliseum and Coliseum 2 a lot. Um, and every time I go in there, Smash Bros. Melee is always sold out. Like, you go in there, and it's all you went to, so you have to go get, like, SD Gundam fighting game, which was actually fun, and, um... Like, uh, I remember being scared as crap at Luigi's Mansion. Actually, you know what? Next to podcast, we're going to do an episode about growing up in the uh, uh, in the 2000s, because why not? Makes sense. Why not? Because I can make more me memories about that or something, so, uh... <laughs> yeah, we'll just do <coughs> more of that. I'm dying of laughter here. <laughs> the early 2000s was... The, ter the year 2000 and so on was where our gaming addiction really kicked in. But the 90s was where we enjoyed being basically a kid and watching cartoons and stuff like that. And the reruns and everything. And heck, I think the reruns help a whole lot since we've become big fans of like so many of the stuff that like with Looney Tunes and the Muppets and Boomerang reruns and such. Because uh, reruns is not a bad thing. And I would love to it's see, I would love to see Nickelodeon and Cartoon Network and even Disney Channel rerun some of the older cartoons like I would love to see Disney rerun like Timon and Pumbaa uh, The Many Adventures of Winnie the Pooh rerun it on Disney those. XD uh, and then I would love to see like Cartoon Network have Dexter's Laboratory and Johnny Bravo and Nickelodeon love to see like reruns like I know technically they have a separate Nickelodeon channel called Nicktoons but on the main main Nickelodeon channel they'll be nice uh, or or at least nowadays, since we're getting, like, streaming services and stuff, at least have, like, some kind of service plan to where you could do stuff like that, you know? I know Nickelodeon branches out the uh, shows to, like, Hulu and Verb, but, like, I can definitely see Nickelodeon make a killing since they have so many shows and movies and stuff. They can they easily... They a lot of shows. They so, can yeah. easily make, like, a Nickelodeon app. Heck, they can do, like... They can, like, add in some of the shows they have... Uh, before they create Nicktoons, like Inspect the Gadget, uh, Looney Tunes, like do that kind of like as a little homage. If they could do Looney Tunes, remember Warner Brothers, they yeah, may but not like, want to license it. But like with like Pinwheel and uh, Inspect the Gadget and Count Duckula. Yeah, Count Duckula, that was on Nickelodeon. So like they could do that. That'd be like a fun little nod to the history because Nickelodeon is an old channel. It is. Like when people think of Nickelodeon, they immediately think of like. Uh, it started out with uh, Nicktoons, but like they've been around since like 76, but they were named differently, but I can't remember what the original name was. But And then you got Nick and Knight. Yeah, like they could have like Full House and Sister Sisters. Wait, I think Sister Sisters I love ABC. I love Lucy. That was a thing that they did. Didn't they have Flipper? They did, actually. Yeah, Flipper. Um, now I keep... I keep messing this up, so please help me with this. Was Family Matters on Nick and Knight? Yeah. Okay, good. It was. Whenever, in his earlier seasons, it was. And then, and then, then got, I imagine towards the end of the season 6, 7, or 8, they changed uh, company stations. Yeah, which I've been watching Family Matters, no joke, uh, and I've been loving it. It's just a great show. I love Carl Rinsler. He's like my favorite character. And Steve Urkel's a classic character in television, but... Uh, um, but yeah, we're like gaming for like 90s. Again, we just only grew up with the N64 and it wasn't until Kingdom Hearts came out in 2002 and we discovered a PS2 that that's when our gaming stuff kicked out. But for us, it was the N64 and we played a lot. We rented. Heck, I remember when me, you and dad played Smash Bros. That was mind joggling for me. It's like Fox, Pikachu, and Mario in the same game. Try to do the Home Alone face, but uh, I can't. I I think most people will probably be wanting to ask this question, so I'm just going ahead and throw this in there before we kick off. Uh, Power Rangers in the 90s. I only remember watching the uh, two segment of Power Rangers, the first major series, and then the next evolution. After that, I don't remember any more of it because I, I fully kind of devolved from Power Rangers. I I can't remember much of me being a huge Power Rangers fan or not. I if nothing else, after Power Rangers, uh, Beetleborgs was a big thing for us. I think Beetleborgs is done by the same company. I wouldn't doubt it. I mean, I think it's a Saban series. 
But yeah, I remember Beetleborgs more than do Power Rangers. Yeah, <laughs> ironically. actually, I kind of liked the Beetleborgs better than Power Rangers. Yeah, because it was cool. It had a, uh, well, I don't know, both the theme songs for Beetleborgs and Power Rangers, both of them were good, but like... They were. But like, uh... Yeah, but I liked the, the uh, characters of Beetleborgs, like, yeah. uh... <laughs> oh yeah, like, I love the people in the Haunted Mansion. All of them were great. They were, they were funny yeah, just so to watch. I think... Beetleborg stands up because the characters are a lot more likable and recognizable, whereas Power Rangers, aside from uh, the bullies, that's really about it. Like, I don't remember, like, the main characters' names or anything. No offense, but, like, they never really stood out to me. So I think that's the reason why Beetleborgs uh, admire to us more. Right. So, um, but yeah, the 90s, they were good. Yeah. They were peace. Wait, that's the wrong. <laughs> they were extreme. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's like extreme and all that. It's like oh gosh. I think I think people gave '90s the assumption that it was extreme just because of it, and then the early 2000s, they were trying to hang on to the extreme part, and everyone was like, just let that go, let that go. That's, I think that's, that's kind of I think that's kind of similar to like how the '80s try to die during the 90s. Yeah, how people was hanging on to the 80s and people were like, just just let that go. It's the 90s, yeah. just let that go. Although, I'm, God, I have to be completely honest, like, looking back, like, I know technically we were still, we're still technically in the 10s, but the 2010s uh, can't, I don't know, it just doesn't have anything that makes it stand out compared to, like, the 2000s. Like, the 70s, 80s, and 90s, you can definitely separate them. And the 2000s, you can as well, but uh, we're, like, tw like, thinking through, like, the two 2010s, it's, too sim it's similar to, like, 2000s, but with more people getting offended and iPads everywhere. Yeah. I think we can say that the 10s were nothing more than just advanced technology and people getting offended easily. Which is not a good theme. Yeah, but I still I still like them. Each year has always been good. Yeah. I get a pet peeve I have is when people keep saying like, 2018 is the worst year ever, 2017 is the worst year ever. It's like, focus on the good, not the bad, people. It's like I'm getting sick to death of hearing people complain, heck, I haven't even watched like any people doing like top 10 worst games list. It's like, it... Yes, there are stuff that ha bad stuff that happened, but the the good outweighs the bad to me. And it's like, can we focus on like the good for each year, please? Yeah, but since we're in 2019, we have some better stuff to look forward to. So let's talk about that real quickly before we end, because I've already said that three, four times now. Uh, I count it four, but I. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so. What are you looking forward to to 2019 the most? Making random videos, uh, getting closer with God every day. I'm doing, I'm, that's part, that's something I always look forward to because I know I'm doing good up the world to heaven. Uh, and just having fun making new videos. I got some videos that I, are going to be out of this world. Okay, they're not going to be our house films, so don't worry. I'm not going David Lynch on people. Don't worry about that. <laughs> but I have some videos in store that I'm really excited to make. And uh, hopefully to do some more uh, collabs, like uh, maybe have you... Actually, that's something we could probably do a Dan Marshall episode of. Uh, talk about, like, gaming in the 2000s or something. I think that'd be pretty cool. That's something we could do, yeah. Yeah, I, I would actually be up for that, you know? Do, like, a retrospective or something. Yeah. Uh, the biggest thing that I'm looking forward to in the 90s is Shreeman, uh Kingdom Hearts 3. Obviously, we've been waiting for that for so long. And then, of course, Biomutant, whenever that one finally comes out. For me, the game I'm most excited for is Super Neptunia RPG. <laughs> Hasn't had an official release date aside from Spring 2019, but I'm predicting maybe May or June. I'm predicting more on that. I say it'll be April or May because we're talking Spring here. Uh, if it's April, I'll be happy just <laughs> whenever. But I'm trying to think, what other games... I guess it's not like a game this year aside from... Super Neptunia that I'm really excited. Like, I know Luigi's Mansion Flea and uh, Yoshi's Crafty World is coming out, but I'm not as excited for them, and plus they don't have a official release date. Even though Luigi's Mansion Flea, I can easily see September or October. Yeah. Maybe November. 
be funny if it was an October release, because then they can go Halloween theme on it. Wait a sec, hold on, I just bought something. What's that? If, because you know how Nintendo games are released on Fridays, right? Yeah. I'm just curious. Drop by one day! Halloween's on a Thursday, so... <laughs> if it was on Friday, that would be the pen perfect release day for it. I mean, seriously, how cool would that be to have, like, a, a, a Halloween-themed game released on the Halloween? Well, look at it this way. On midnight, on the witching hour, when people do their midnight releases, Luigi's Mansion will be released, technically. That's... well... I'm just saying, if they did... Probably, yeah. I mean, I know there are people who are excited for another Luigi's Mansion, even though I still need to play Dark Moon. I haven't played it yet, but I heard some good things about it, actually. Technically, I've never beaten the first one. I've gotten, like, halfway through it, but I've never really beaten the first one. Well, I got the... Oh, yeah, yeah, someone bought a game and they haven't bought it back to me yet. <laughs> I can easily get it again. It's no worry. Uh, but still... Anything else before I can end this? I think that's about it for the time being right now. Yeah, so... This makes for a good comeback video anyway. Yeah, and we'll hopefully do some walk, but we can't guarantee it. Uh, just whenever we get a chance to. I do like doing these podcasts. I've been wanting to do one for quite some time, so... We're going to try to at least evaluate it towards once a month, but we will see what happens. We yeah. cannot guarantee. I'm fine with once a month. But I'm fine with once a month, too. Yeah, we'll just have to win and see Anyway, with that in mind, if you have any questions that you would like to see us ask here on the Modern Studios Podcast, you can do either two things. Either one, comment in the bottom of this video, or go to my personal email address, danielmollinsfleet at gmail.com. That's my personal email address, so if you have any questions for the podcast or something, or you just want to say hi, or help uh, suggest us on how we can improve the podcast or any of our videos, let us know, and don't forget to check out Black Cross on Twitch. He has a Twitch channel. <laughs> Have like a laser light show going. <laughs> you do realize I'm gonna do that, right? I hope you do. Like a laser light show. Point uh <laughs> Not so much a laser light show, but some kind of neon flashing light saying, "Join Black Cross on Twitch" or something. Hey, you got what? Close to forty people following you? Uh, thirty-three now. Yeah. Oh, okay. I mean, record, in the span of almost uh, over a year now, I've gotten 33. So I'm almost halfway to where I'm at my uh, subscriber count towards uh, YouTube. So. You know, I think I'm going to do you a favor. I'm going to start every single Mullins video. It's like, this episode is brought to you by Black Cross uh, Trist Channel. Don't do that. Now people are going to think I am Bob. Like, come and, on and come to me on Twitch and follow me on Instagram, MySpace, Snapchat, Twitter, and, and all I that. And I don't rap. Please don't rap. Don't you ever, ever rap. <laughs> you can rap presents, but not rap. Uh, okay, we ramble on long enough. So, thank you guys for watching this. God bless you, and they will see. You, we will see you all in the next Mullen Studios podcast. So, bye bye. Catch you guys later.